in the highest. Happy Palm Sunday, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna. Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna to the Son of David. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Welcome to worship today on this Palm and Passion Sunday here at St. Luke First and Lydia's Place in the city of Ashboro. May you be blessed today as we worship together. And now let us join together in welcoming Jesus into Jerusalem as we start our journey towards the cross this Holy Week.
join in the affirmation of faith. We believe that God is continually at work in our lives and in our world to heal strife and discord, to comfort the lonely and grieving, to encourage the disheartened, to offer hope to those who despair, to reconcile warring factions. We believe that the same Jesus who rode into Jerusalem on a donkey entered our hearts today. Triumphs might be with the power of love, shows the way of strength through weakness, calls us his friends and family, invites us to share his life. We believe that the Spirit has been given to remind us of the identity in Christ, to empower us to take up the cross, to enable us to abide in Christ's love, to explicate for us the word of God, to enliven us a resurrection people in a fallen world. This we believe so that we might joyfully share God's life and faithfully live as Christian disciples. Good morning, First Kids. 
so today is a very special day in the church. Does anyone know what it's called? It's called Palm Sunday. That's right. It's the Sunday before Easter. So what does Palm Sunday mean? It celebrates the day that Jesus rode on a donkey into Jerusalem. People gathered and cheered and called him a king. It was like a parade. The people in Jerusalem were so happy to see Jesus, and they knew that he was very important. So they took palm branches from the trees that lined the road and gathered to form a celebration. Usually on Palm Sunday, we walk through the church singing songs, waving our palms and celebrating Jesus, just like the people did in Jerusalem that day. And when the people waved their palms in the air, they shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Does anyone know what Hosanna means? It means Savior, or save now we pray in Hebrew. And Jesus had come to save the people. Now is a time for us to remember Jesus' last days and the love that he has for each and every one of us. And to remember that God's love is everlasting and that he sent his only son for us. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for all of your love, for sending your Son from heaven above. In times of doubt, you give us light. May we always keep you in our sight. Amen. See you guys soon. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany, near Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter, you will find tied there a colt that has never been written. Untie this colt and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Just say this, The Lord needs it, and I will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, Why are you untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed him to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of our Lord. Blessed is the king, coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he had went out to Bethany with the twelve. Remember what happened, right? Jesus in a parade. He's riding a borrowed colt. It's a march, a movement. We call it the triumphal entry. People are in front of and behind Jesus. They are shouting their hosannas. They are throwing down palms and their cloaks for him to ride on. They are rolling out the red carpet. There's excitement and anticipation. This Jesus is really going somewhere. Something big is happening. Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus rides into Jerusalem. He enters the temple. He looks around at everything and he leaves. He does nothing. He says nothing. He just leaves. He goes to Bethany. It's a strange and and a climatic ending to the triumphal entry. It sounds like Jesus is retreating and getting out of town. What's that all about? Did Jesus have somewhere else he needed to be? I wonder if he was scared. You know, Holy Week can be 
a little scary sometimes. I wonder if he was wavering a bit, not as sure when he started that ride. Maybe he was having some doubts, some questions, and just wanted to get away. You know, this is a strange and anticlimactic ending, like I've said, to the triumphal entry. That it makes me think there has to be something significant here. And it's unique. Mark's gospel is the only gospel that says Jesus entered the temple, looked around, and left. So why did Jesus leave the temple and go to Bethany? The gospel tells us Jesus left the temple as it was already late. So that got me to wondering, what if this is about something more than just the time of day? What if Jesus is late getting somewhere or doing something? What might Jesus be late for? Maybe he is late in returning the cult. Jesus sent two disciples to borrow this colt and told them if anyone asked why they were taking the colt, they were to say, the Lord needs it and will send it back here immediately. And that's what they did. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. So what if that's why Jesus left the temple? Maybe he left so he could keep his promise and follow through on what he said he would do. Maybe this is about Jesus being true to himself and keeping his word. What if this is about Jesus staying centered with himself despite what the weak holds for him? What if returning the cold is a metaphor for us as we enter into and walk through this upcoming Holy Week? What might returning the cold mean for us throughout this upcoming week? Maybe it's an image or a metaphor to ponder, and it raises a couple of questions. First, what do you need to return this week? What do you need to release or let go of? You know, we all have stuff that we've carried around with us for far too long. It's no longer able to take us anywhere or give us life. It's just baggage we carry that continues to just weigh us down. It impoverishes life. It corrupts our hearts. What do you need to let go of, release, and return to this week? Is it a grudge or resentment, anger, fear, disappointment and regret, guilt, envy? Maybe you need to return being in control, having to be right, a need for approval, perfectionism. I don't know what it is for you, but I am convinced that we all have our stuff. Maybe Holy Week is a time to return and release it all to God. Trusting that God can do something with this stuff. And what if returning and releasing this stuff is also about returning to ourselves? What if it's about returning to our very center? What if it's about reclaiming our truest self? That means we could then move forward, not from the same old place, but from the newly recovered center. That's what Jesus did. He stayed true to himself throughout the week, and so must we. So maybe returning the cold is ultimately about returning to our original self, that self of beauty and goodness that God created in us and has loved from the very beginning. What if those are the movements throughout this week, returning, releasing, and letting go, and returning to and reclaiming those parts of ourselves that have been lost, ignored, forgotten, or denied. Even as we carry around that stuff that needs to be returned, so also there are parts of ourselves and our lives to which we do need to return to. So what do you need to return to, brothers and sisters? What if we return to joy, hope, truth, and honesty? What if we came back to justice, mercy, forgiveness? What if we reclaim the dignity and holiness of each human life? What if we recenter ourselves in peace and courage? What if 
every return to love of neighbor, self, an enemy. Coming back to ourselves would be like a new life, wouldn't it? So we begin this week by returning the cult. What do you need to return? To answer them, we must look around at everything. That's what Jesus did. It's not so much just looking around at everything outside of us, but looking around at everything within us. Look at what's there, brothers and sisters. Look at what's missing. Look at what you need, what you feel, who you truly are, and who you want to be, and who God has intended for you to be, and then return the cult. Take that image of returning the cult with you this week. Take it wherever you go. Bring it to whatever you do. Hold it as you pray the liturgies of the week. Let it be present as you live your life and as you encourage people and relationships, whether in family, at work, or at school, at the grocery store, or wherever. Returning the cult is how Holy Week begins. Returning to God and ourselves is the promise of how this week will end. Look around at everything and then go return the cult and reclaim the life that Christ wants you to have. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. It is always a holy time when the people of God come together to pray to God. And so I'll invite you into a time of prayer now. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, creator of all that is, seen and unseen, giver of life and light, you love us with an everlasting love. We worship you this day and every day, some of us with hearts that are full and grateful, others with hearts that are empty and grieving. Fill us once again with your holy breath, that we might remember who we are and whose we are, your children made in your image. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of all grace and mercy, you have made an amazing and beautiful world, diverse and teeming with both bounty and beauty. As we see and hear and smell the signs of new life abounding all around us, we wave our palm branches in great joy for your arrival in our midst as we shout our hosannas. Grateful that you have saved us and that you continue to save us even when we don't know we need saving. Give us hearts to recognize your saving grace today. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Forgiving God, we have waved our palm branches this morning. And yet we know that even now, the shadows of life lurk in the darkness of our hearts. Envy, hatred, racism, judgment, despair, the desire for power and wealth at the expense of the well-being of others. As your son travels the path to the cross once again, we confess that it is our sinfulness that still makes his journey necessary. Forgive us this day and every day and make us humble to receive your mercy. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of peace and justice, we pray for those 40,000 people in our country who have and who will lose their lives to needless and senseless gun violence this year. We remember the grieving families in Atlanta in Boulder and even here in our community of Ashboro as they bury their loved ones. We mourn that we, though not perpetrators of this violence, continue to condone it through our silence and inaction. Help us as we remember this week our role in your son Jesus' death, to be the voices that go against the crowd who calls for Barabbas instead of Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Lord, in your mercy, 
hear our prayer. God of life, we pray for those who live without meaning and hope. Lead your church, we pray, toward a new vision of your mission in Christ. Give your church the strength to stand against the powers of sin and darkness that fill our world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Tender and loving God, lead us as we minister to those who are hurting, lonely, sick, grieving, or in danger. Pour out your spirit on those who are suffering. We pray for those who are still being affected by COVID in any way. And we pray especially today for our friends and neighbors of Asian and Pacific Islander descent, as many live in fear of hatred and violence being carried out against them. We pray for their safety and well-being, and we ask for courage to speak out on their behalf. We pray for our families and our friends, both near and far. Give us the assurance that you are here among your people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As Jesus prayed that all who follow him might be one, reshape us as your faithful disciples and knit us tightly with all those who profess Christ into his one body. May our unity and our diversity proclaim his name to all the world as we glorify you together. We pray these things in Jesus' name and in his spirit as we pray the prayer he taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It is always an act of worship when the people of God return to God, a portion of what God has first given to us. And so I'll invite you now to share in this time of offering our tithes, our gifts.
Good morning. I'll be reading Psalms 118, verses 1 and 2, and 19 through 29. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let Israel say his love endures forever. Shouts of joy and victory resounds in the tents of the righteous. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. The Lord's right hand is lifted high. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. I will not die, but live, and will proclaim what the Lord has done. The Lord has chastened me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open for me the gates of righteousness, and I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord, through which the righteous may enter. I will give you thanks, for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone the builder rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. The Lord has done it this very day. Let us rejoice and be glad. Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But the house of the Lord, we bless you. The Lord is God. He has made his light shine on us. With bows and hand, join the festive procession up to the horn of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God. I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. We have heard the scriptures read and the proclamation of the text from Mark proclaiming Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem heralded as a king, shouts of Hosanna. Jesus is welcomed into the city with great fanfare and praises. Then later in the week, the crowd figured out that Jesus is not the kind of king that they had expected or wanted. They turned their shouts of Hosanna into shouts of crucify him. His peaceful, humble entry into Jerusalem turns into a violent, cruel killing. They wanted an army general riding in with chariots of war, and they got a carpenter riding on the back of a donkey. There were probably people that day standing on the sidelines that were just following the crowd. They were unsure of what to do. They heard the rabble rousers, the the loud and few uh, loud and misguided voices. They stirred the crowd to have Pilate hand Jesus over to be flogged, beaten, ridiculed, and hung on a cross until his death. The people reacted. The people turned uh, Jesus into a criminal. Just before they had stood singing his praises. And now they turn him into a criminal because they have a hard time understanding who Jesus is and what Jesus is about. Sometimes uh, in life, uh, just as the people turned on Jesus, people also turn on us. Well, do the same thing when our best friend says something cruel about us behind our backs and we wonder, what in the world did we do? When we st stood at an altar with, with uh, our loved, uh, of the love of our life and made solemn vows with them and then they break those vows and find themselves, we find ourselves in a place that we never imagined. When our boss at work or our supervisor suddenly seems displeased with our work and we're baffled as to why. When someone breaks our trust and when we were once the apple of their eye and now we're the apple that spoils the whole bunch according to them. When these things happen to us, when others turn on us, 
We are in good company because the people then turned on Jesus. They took Jesus from being the king on the back of a donkey riding in a great parade. They took him to criminal row, bringing him to be tried and hung on a cross. That's exactly what they did on the first Holy Week. Transformed Jesus from a king to a criminal. Now, before we get all judgmental about the people gathered on the side of the road shouting Hosanna and the people gathered as the crowd before Pontius Pilate shouting crucify him, before we get all judgmental about that, do we not sometimes often do the same thing? We do it to Jesus and we do it to each other. We sometimes accuse Jesus of not listening, not being there for us. We sometimes paint Jesus as someone that we want Jesus to be instead of who Jesus really is. We do it to Jesus. We do it to one another. We turn on each other. We turn our backs on God. We don't understand the depth of Christ's love and how we are to live in love in this world. It's so hard for us to understand, just as it was hard for the people back then to understand, because it is so different from what the world expects. They did not understand it then, and we still don't understand it now. For Jesus is a different kind of king and he has a different kind of kingdom. The, this kingdom of Jesus is where love prevails, even in the midst of evil. This is the kind of kingdom where love prevails over hate. When Asian Americans are killed in their places of business and others are gunned down while they're doing their everyday grocery shopping. This is the kingdom where love prevails. This is the kingdom where we take a stand against hatred and violence. This is the kingdom where the head of the kingdom gets down on his knees and washes the feet of his friends. He's the kind of king that cares for the woman that misses her dead brother. He's the kind of king that heals and restores a man who's not much used to society, a leper on the outskirts. He's the kind of king that forgives a woman who others want to kill. He's the kind of king that stands at the fence as a rejected father with his arms opened wide, welcoming his lost son. He's the kind of king that leaves the 99 in order to find one lost soul. He's the kind of king that when we commit a crime so grievous that we are about to be executed, that he's the kind of king that comes and stands in for us and dies for us to free us from sin and death. He's the kind of king that rides into Jerusalem, not on a stallion to conquer the Romans, but on a donkey to conquer life and death for me and you and the whole world. He's the kind of king where love and hope and peace and justice prevails and does so without domination. He's the kind of king that had all the power in heaven and earth to come down off the cross and chooses not to do so. He's the kind of king who died forgiving the very ones who had killed him. He's the kind of king that understood the people standing on the side, welcoming him into Jerusalem, who later stood in the crowd and shouted, Crucify him. This week, shouts of Hosanna. Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna. This week, we too will turn. And we will do the shouting of crucify him. For this day, Palm Sunday, is not in anticipation of Easter Sunday. It is in anticipation of Good Friday. Because this Friday, we will see the depth of his love. This Friday, we will understand maybe just a little more about the love that Christ has given to us on the cross. And then on Saturday, we won't be able to breathe. 
Because we will not have hope on Saturday and we will know what it means to be on our own without the risen Christ. We will know what it means to be alone. So now as we turn to go to Holy Week, as we face Calvary, as we face Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday, we can be part of the crowd. We are part of the crowd that stands on the sidelines and shouts, Hosanna. And we can be a part of the crowd that also screams crucify him for our sins. For the sins that we commit every day. This week we travel and go with Jesus. And may we know the depth of this great love. The love that gives us new life. As we go through this holy week. In order to come to Sunday morning on the beautiful Easter day. So now let us go and travel together and follow him to the cross. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Mark 15. As soon as it was morning, the chief priest held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to the pilot. Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered him, You say so. Then the chief priests accused him of many things. Pilate asked him again, Have you no answer? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further reply. So the Pilate was amazed. Now at the festival he used to release a prisoner for them anyone from whom they asked. Now a man called Barabbas was in prison with the rebels who had committed murder during the insurrection. So the crowd came and began to ask Pilate to do for them according to his custom. Then he answered them, do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that the chief priest had handed him over. But the chief priests stirred up to the crowd to have them have him released. Barabbas, for them instead, Pilate spoke to them again. Then what do you wish me to do with this man? You call the king of the Jews. They shouted back, crucify him. Pilate asked them, why, what evil has he done? But well, they should, they shouted all the more, crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas for them, and after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to the crucified. The soldiers led Jesus away into the palace, that is the praetorium, and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him, then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. And they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews! Again and again they struck him on the head with a staff and spit on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, and the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him. Dividing up his clothes, they cast lots to see what each would get. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. They crucified two rebels with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, so, you are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days. Come down from the cross and save yourself. In the way the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he cannot save himself. Let this Messiah, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, 
Eloi, Eloi, Lima Sabatani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, listen, he is calling for Elijah. And someone ran, filled a sponge sat with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink, saying, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. Then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was God's son. There were also women looking on from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Jesus the younger, and of Hoseas and Shalom. These used to follow him and provide for him when he was in Galilee. And there were many other women who had came up with him to Jerusalem. When evening had come, and since it was the day of preparation, that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself waiting expectantly for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate wondered if he were already dead, and summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he had been dead for some time. When he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the body to Joseph. Then Joseph brought a linen cloth and taking the body down, wrapped it in the linen cloth and laid it in a tomb that had been hewn out of the rock. He then rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph saw where the body was laid.
now that we have proclaimed Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And that we have proclaimed Jesus' walk to the cross. Let us walk together this holy week. And experience the depth of God's love. And the suffering of Christ's crucifixion. And celebrate the power of the resurrection. Together on the beautiful Easter morning. May you experience the love of God, the peace of Christ, the communion of the Spirit this week as we journey together during this high and holy week and we journey towards the cross.